Hi, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. It's um, so great to see so many of you here. I know it's a very busy time of the semester, um, so we're really happy to, to have you here. Uh, for our final Human Rights in Practice event of the semester, the past and future of human rights in theory and practice, 75 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN General Assembly on December 10th, 1948. And so that was the idea behind having this event today. The event is co-sponsored by the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Human Rights Law Society, and the International Law Society, and organized by both the International Human Rights Clinic and the Center for International and Comparative Law. I'm very excited to welcome our three speakers, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. So first we have RJ Thompson Rodriguez, Managing Director of the Urban Justice Center. RJ is a longtime human rights lawyer, organizer, and educator, as well as a certified personal trainer, go-go dancer, and performer in the adult film industry. Prior to joining the Sex Workers Project as Managing Director, RJ worked in the Fair Courts Project Community Educator, worked as the Fair Courts Project Community Educator at Lambda Legal, where he trained judges, attorneys, and court staff on gender and sexuality cultural competency, and also advocated for judicial diversity and independence in Arizona, Texas, Florida, and the federal bench. Previously, RJ served as the Miami High Road Coordinator with the Restaurant Opportunity Center United, fighting for increased wages, health care, and paid time off for restaurant workers, as well as director of the Human Rights Program at the Woodhill Sexual Freedom Alliance, where he advocated for the human rights of sex workers in the UN Universal Periodic, Periodic Review of the United States. We'll hear from Bashak Chali, who we see on the screen, professor of international law at the Hershey School in Berlin and co-director of the School Center for Fundamental Rights. She's an expert in international law and institutions, as well as international human rights law and policy. She's authored publications on theories of international law, the relationship between international and domestic law, standards of review in international law, interpretation of human rights law, legitimacy of human rights courts, and implementation of human rights judgments. She is also the chair of the European Implementation Network and a fellow of the Human Rights Center at the University of Essex, and has acted as a Council of Europe expert on the European Convention on Human Rights since 2002. She has extensive experience in training members of the judiciary and lawyers across Europe in the field of human rights law. And finally, we're very happy to hear from Benyam Dawit Mesmore, member and former chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. He is also professor of law at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. And from 2022 to July 2023, he served as Eleanor Roosevelt Visiting Fellow at the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School. He's also project head of the Children's Rights Project at the Dula Omar Institute for Constitutional Law, Governance, and Human Rights at the University of the Western Cape. And with that, we'll get started with R.J. Thompson Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, can you all hear me okay? All right. So <clears throat> again, my name is R.J. Thompson Rodriguez. I use he and they pronouns. I'm a managing director at the Urban Justice Center, which is, um, for those of you that don't know, is a large NGO based in New York. But we have several anchor projects two of which I direct, the Human Rights Project and the Sex Workers Project, and those are both national in scope. So some of our projects are New York, um, local in scope, but my two projects are national in scope. We provide both direct legal services and also do education and policy work in the Sex Workers Project, and the Human Rights Project for about 20 years now has educated U.S. social justice activists on how to use international human rights frameworks and standards in domestic advocacy, which has also been um, my specialization in the law as a human rights lawyer in the US. 
Um, so that's a little bit about um, my organization. And I've been doing uh, human rights advocacy specifically with a focus on the United States um, for 23 years um, as a lawyer since 2005. And um, as was read in my bio, uh, I consider myself a human rights defender first and foremost. I've worked in seven different social justice movements. And for me, uh, the human rights framework is what really has linked all of those various movements and issues. Um, I was going to apologize to my colleagues who are on virtually for going first because I don't think the United States should ever be allowed to go first um, when we're talking about human rights. Half joking, but uh, I am really honored to be here um, as a human rights expert sort of in a U.S. context because as some of you may know, the human rights framework um, is used far too infrequently in the United States. Uh, we are an extremely exceptionalist and insular country in many ways, including in terms of our understanding of adherence to international human rights norms and law. But thankfully, um, there are several law schools and several NGOs that have been doing human rights work focused in the US. Um, and when I say human rights work, I mean intentionally using a human rights framework or human rights law, because all social justice advocacy is human rights work. It's just that we don't often still use that language in the United States. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of give a little bit of what I think, based on the theme of today, the UDHR has meant specifically the Universal Declaration and what it might mean moving forward for advocacy, particularly in my context, uh, in a US context. And I did specifically choose when I went to law school to continue to focus on domestic social justice advocacy, but using human rights law rather than what many people do from the US, which is work abroad um, when they're interested in human rights, because I felt like we need to build a human rights culture in the United States. We need to hold the US government accountable to human rights standards so it is not exceptionalist at the local, state, and federal level, which um, you know, it was a long struggle ahead. We've made some gains, I think, in terms of uh, NGO participation and human rights mechanisms who are representing U.S. civil society over the past 20 years, thanks in part to the U.S. Human Rights Network and the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers ne um, Network and others who have really tried to get social justice movements in the U.S. to embrace this framework. But specifically around the UDHR, for me, it is so important, this document that is 75 years old, because it really sets a high and progressive standard, in my opinion, for people's basic human needs and human dignity. And very importantly for us in the United States, the UDHR includes economic, social, and cultural rights. So. Some of you may not know. I really hope that all of you who don't know read the book Eyes Off the Prize um, because it sets out the history of why the United States focuses on civil and political rights to the detriment of economic, social, and cultural rights. That is a purposeful thing that we do in the United States. It has a deep history where social justice activists, including the Black Liberation Movement, as far back as the 50s, shortly after the UDHR was created, um, were really coerced uh, into not addressing economic and social rights, which in my view are some of the very root causes of civil rights issues that we face. Um, because if people don't have health and education and housing and decent work, uh, you know, what how important are voting rights for people who are, who are surviving to meet their daily needs? So the UDHR is a comprehensive framework and document that includes this full spectrum of human rights. Uh, I will note when I talk about the full spectrum of human rights, I also include environmental human rights and sexual human rights, which have uh, started to become more codified, but really are coming into uh, legitimacy in the international system because of mostly Global South grassroots activism. 
So like for us in the sex worker rights movement, that's really important. And um, the sex worker rights movement actually is one of the movements I've worked in that has actually seen tangible results from international processes like the Universal Periodic Review, where in 2010 we were able to get a recommendation from Uruguay to the United States uh, around discrimination and violence facing sex workers, um, as well as trans people, both named in that recommendation. And we were able to utilize that tool uh, for policy work at the federal level coming out of that universal periodic review process. So, and this is linked, the UPR process, which I'm sure we'll talk more about with my colleagues, but is very much linked to the UDHR and its importance because in the United States, we've ratified so few human rights treaties. Um, and even when we do, they're full of reservations, understandings, uh, and all of these things that compromise the intent and purpose of the treaty. Um, but for the sake of argument, you know, we have a few human rights treaties, CAT and CERT and ICCPR that we have ratified, but the Economic and Social Rights Treaty, for example, or the uh, other human rights treaties, we have not. But the UDHR, I'm sorry, the University per Universal Periodic Review Process, which happens every five years, has given U.S. advocates an opportunity to raise economic and social rights issues because it looks at the totality of a country's human rights record, including um, declarations like the UDHR. So that is, in terms of the theme of theory and practice, for me, the UPR really linked, in my own personal experience as an advocate, theory into practice, taking um, issues we were facing here in the United States, sex workers in that context in particular in 2010, and saying to the world stage, the UN in Geneva, this is what we're facing in the US, the United States doesn't recognize X, Y, Z, and then to see a peer-to-peer -peer review process, um, country to country, that resulted in you know, documenting, to my knowledge, one of the first times, if not the first time, sex work was named in a US context in an international mechanism, and then be able to bring that, not just for the sake of going to Geneva and doing it, but bringing it home um, to both create policy change at the federal level, but also uh, it really galvanized. It was a moment of uniting and movement building, the sex worker rights movement. Uh, many, of, many of those advocates had never heard of a UPR or international human rights for that matter. And many of them were able through the US Human Rights Network and others to go to Geneva and experience that process so it really galvanized the movement for quite some time after the UPR. Um, and you know, we were asked before the event what the UDHR has meant, but also what might it be moving forward. And my hope is that for the United States, that people's movements continue to grow you know, around racial justice, Black Lives Matter, environmental racism, climate justice, all of these different issues that we're facing in the US and globally and say, look, there's something beyond US constitutional law. There's something beyond just local, state, and federal advocacy that most of the rest of the world recognizes as tools um, and as somewhere to go to state your claim and that US activists will continue to embrace international mechanisms. I think in particular the UPR more and more um, that's my hope. And that the UDHR, you know, I see it as a very timeless document in many ways to look at, if you read it today and you think it was written 75 years ago, in my opinion, it is so progressive um, and in many ways could have been drafted now. So, you know, it's a really living, breathing document, but people have to give it its power. People often ask me, well, what is the sense of doing human rights-based, international human rights uh, standard-based advocacy in the United States because the United States doesn't care about it? And my answer is always, the only way that human rights culture will exist and change is through activists and human rights lawyers, you know, speaking in a law school audience, if public interest lawyers, social justice lawyers don't create a human rights culture in the courts, for example, um, and change the jurisprudence to say, actually, these standards are relevant um, and also not in conflict with constitutional law, for example, in many ways, who will? 
So I think it is our responsibility as global citizens, all of which I hope we are or strive to be, um, especially those of us living in the US where it is countercultural to be a global citizen, that we uh, really embrace human rights. And just to wrap up uh, before, you know, I know we have Q&A, I wanted to bring the theory to practice a little bit more tangible even, and especially for the law students, um, I'm often asked, what are some tangible, practical ways you use human rights in U.S. advocacy? And so a few of those that have been really powerful are human rights education at every level um, in schools, right? Some countries have human rights education in schools. We very rarely do in the U.S., um, but also the courts. As I said, I did that work um, with U.S. NGOs educating court staff and judges and lawyers uh, on human rights standards really human rights education at every level of society, and also in social justice NGOs. Um, the Human Rights Project of UJC has done that for years, helping NGOs to embrace the framework. Another way is um, utilizing the Inter-American Commission, uh, which ironically in many ways is, you know, right in DC, but in my opinion, extremely underutilized by US advocates. Integrating human rights legal arguments strategically into local and state court cases, Another great resource is human rights in state courts. The Opportunity Agenda published that, um, many iterations of that, where it gives specific examples of lawyers using international human rights arguments in family law cases, criminal law cases, beyond sort of just the death penalty and torture, which is where it has traditionally been brought up, and how doing that gradually transforms jurisprudence in ways that, it, it, when it's strategic. Uh, another example is, of course, federal advocacy for treaty ratification for the treaties we don't have, engaging in shadow reporting for the treaties we are a party to uh, for U.S. compliance, advocating for local and city human rights commissions. This has been really interesting work to broaden their mandate beyond just anti-discrimination complaints, for example. So a lot of cities have, including New York City and very major cities, have human rights commissions. That's what they're often named. But they often have a very narrow mandate around civil rights and sometimes even more narrow than that, like anti-discrimination. And so we've done some work with New York in New York City, for example, getting the commission to understand its own name, what a human rights commission actually would be at a local level and to address things like housing, for example, economic and social rights. And then finally, HRP, my organization, worked for many, many years prior to my being at, at the Urban Justice Center to try to get New York City Council to implement both CERD and CEDAW as local law in an intersectional way that looked at women of color as um, the nexus for bringing all of these sort of intersectional issues together in New York City around poverty and housing and work uh, and, and, and gender discrimination and on and on and racial discrimination and policing. So local communities, San Francisco, New York, Durham, you know, Eugene, Oregon, anywhere can, if the city council has the political will to do so, can take the principles of international human rights law and implement them at the local level, sort of circumventing the federal government's uh, abdication of them. So uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, RJ. Shock over to you, please. Okay, I hope you can you can hear me well. Uh, is is the audio okay? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much also for this invitation to Aya and uh, to the legal clinic and all the other organizers. Um, so one of the things that I was invited to reflect on was um, the past and the present of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the European context. So I'd like to just uh, um, make some observations in relation to this. And, you know, maybe to start with, I definitely agree with, um, with RJ that this is a living instrument. I mean, you know, we are constantly breathing new life into the Universal Declaration. Uh, but perhaps uh, I have a slightly different angle as well, that there are certain things about this declaration that may also be a bit limiting because, you know, it doesn't capture our current imagination. So we have to imagine the UDHR constantly. 
But it also means that sometimes people would insist on saying, oh, but that is not in the UDHR. You know, that's not exactly covered. So I will, I will comment on, on this kind of originalism that sometimes people will use against progressive uh, understandings of human rights 75 years um, later on. And uh, that might be interesting. So just, uh, you know, what do we mean by Europe? Maybe I should uh, do a few footnotes of what is Europe. Uh, obviously, there are many Europes. Um, uh, I will talk about the, there is a, you know, the Council of Europe, which actually covers quite a lot of member states, uh, including, you know, uh, those who are not members of the European Union. Uh, we call it the 46 member state Europe. Then we have the European Union, which is a smaller Europe. So when we, and of course, I'm talking to you from Berlin. When we talk about Europe, there are many Europes, right? So you can count very many states depending on uh, where they are. So I think when I will use the European experience, maybe I'll speak more about the larger one. So the, the Council of Europe, as you know, recently, even the Russian Federation was a member. But after the Russian uh, aggression in Ukraine, it uh, ceased to be a member uh, of, of that larger Europe. That's the Council of Europe. So historically speaking, the story of the UDHR in Europe is very, very curious in the sense that European states at the time, they all supported the Universal Declaration. They said, we all agree with it. Uh, Grace document, as RJ said, you know, it's a very comprehensive document, civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights, cultural rights. It's quite an ambitious document. But one of the interesting footnotes that many European states have also made is that they said, but it's not legally binding. Huh? It's a... It's a general assembly resolution. You know, it's not a, a treaty. So, and I'm not so sure that it was an innocent comment to say that it's not legally binding. Because when we look at the treaties that were made in Europe, most famously the European Convention on Human Rights, that was just concluded right after the UDHR in 1950, uh, which is the most important human rights treaty in this part of the world, ECHR as we call it. It omits a lot of things that are not in the Universal Declaration. It doesn't have economic, social, and cultural rights in it. It's a treaty that focuses on civil and political rights only. The UDHR is very important, I think, because of its standalone anti-discrimination clauses. In the ECHR, we, we don't have that. So we, we lost that when the UDHR became a human rights treaty in Europe. Uh, some of the other very important aspects of the UDHR was the right to nationality that was explicitly included in this document. Uh, in the European Convention, we don't have the right to nationality. And also the right to seek asylum, again, is in the UDHR, but it's not in the European Convention. So when the European powers translated the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into their regional human rights treaty, a lot of these very kind of you know, visionary rights that RJ talked about, they became quite diminished. So we ended up with a much shorter list of rights uh, in the ECHR. Uh, and, and some people, including myself, explained this as, you know, having, it's having a wide and general aspirational document was fine for the European powers, but when they wanted to translate it into legal rights, there was a bit of a... Uh, that's what, what do we call it, an economical <laughs> account of, you know, what are the rights that we, we should legalize. And I think it's important that Europe then, even though it supported the UDHR <coughs> at the United Nations, when it came to really talking about their legal rights in Europe, there was something, some very important things that was lost. One of the other important things about the European Convention is, is also what, what we famously call the colonial clause. So even though the UDHR, we place a huge emphasis on it because it says everyone, everyone has these rights, right? And of course, when the UDHR was drafted in 1948, a vast number of the countries around the world were under colonial uh, domination. Uh, you know, we don't have that word in the UDHR, but the European Convention on Human Rights made it optional for the European colonial powers to extend rights in the ECHR to their colonial territories. So I think that's another really important angle, looking at the big promise of UDHR and what has happened to it uh, historically uh, in the European uh, context. So I wouldn't call it a big success story in the legalization of the aspirations in the text. What could we say about the presence 
the present state of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, in the context of Europe, um, I think we can make two observations. One is that I agree with, uh, with again, some of the points that RJ just made is that, you know, it didn't just end with this very limited treaty. The European Convention on Human Rights made these rights a lot limited, but social movements, groups uh, that were trying to use this little treaty, they also were, were asking constantly for European states, the European Court of Human Rights, to interpret these treaties as a living instrument. So this idea that there is something quite aspirational in using human rights in legal practice didn't die out uh, when you know some bits of UDHR became uh, more legal uh, treaty rights uh, in the European context. And I think it was exactly through this type of legal mobilization and advocacy that things that were not in, in this treaty, the European Convention, or even the UDHR itself, have become our part of our imagination uh, about you know what uh, the rights uh, in the Universal Declaration or even in the treaties actually mean um, in in this context. So uh, in a way, that aspirational spirit I think of UDHR lives on um, in in Europe as well. But I think there is also another uh, sort of uh, part of the story, uh, and this uh, maybe comes back to. Uh, a lot of discussions, I don't know how much of it you, you have, I'm sure you have these also in the US context, but in other contexts, is that UDHR did not mention a lot of different groups. It doesn't have, for example, any reference to rights of indigenous peoples or rights of minorities. There are no digital human rights in the UDHR. There is no reference to the climate crisis or climate justice concerns in the Universal Declaration. And it also has some conservative elements. For example, it has a huge emphasis on the right to family. And some people say also the right to property is, is, is in the UDHR. And that, you know, this gives us a different flavor when we talk about um, rights in the global context. And what we, we also see currently in the European uh, setting is that what is not in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights is also sometimes used as, as part of anti-progressive politics and they say well you know you're claiming things uh, that are not in the UDHR and I think this this also comes back to some of the the challenges of people uh, trying to imagine uh, you know how we make the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a living instrument and we also have these very important challenges here uh, for example pitting say the right to family against rights of women or rights of, of, of uh, LGBTQI groups and so on and so forth. So this is also part of a lot of the struggles um, that, um, that we currently see. So I think um, when we talk about the, the past and the present of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the European legal and in the political context, uh, we can make some very optimistic observations, but also we should also look for, for caution about how the Universal Declaration is also used for regressive um, human rights law arguments um, and politics. But I'm happy to talk further on some of these observations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Benjamin, over to you, please. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to join this uh, uh, excellent panel. Uh, and let me start with, um, so thank you very much for the opportunity. I would have loved to join you in, in person, but I have just arrived here in the US uh, after a very long uh, flight and some of my commitments decide uh, didn't allow me to be there. Now, a quick disclaimer, I'm not speaking on behalf of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, but of course, uh, I am an academician and I've spent uh, the last 11 years uh, within the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, but also within the African Union, I've spent another 11 years uh, within the African Union doing work on children's rights. Now, let me make some general observations. The first is, uh, and it also ties well with what RJ and uh, Pashak were saying, uh, two words usually uh, are found in abundance in the literature that often celebrates the UDHR, uh, relevant uh, and, and timeless. And inevitably, it has withstood the test of the past years, uh, and the advent of dramatic new uh, technologies uh, and social, political, uh, and economic developments that its drafters could not have foreseen 
uh, have also been informed by the UDHR. So, so, so credit to them. Um, one thing that I find very interesting, for instance, is that for its time, uh, the document was remarkably lacking in sexist language. Uh, so that's once again uh, credit to the drafters. Uh, it refers to everyone, uh, all uh, or no one throughout the 30 uh, articles. Uh, its impact is seen in domestic legislation permeating more than 90 national constitutions uh, and so forth. I also find it interesting that uh, its link and relevance for efforts to address conflict, uh, particularly preventing conflict, uh, but also its links to development uh, are also some of the credits that, that are actually due uh, to it. I mean, uh, human rights, are, we say, are at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, and we've seen, particularly from research by the Danish Institute for Human Rights, uh, that showed that more than 90% of the SDGs targets uh, are linked to international human rights and labor standards. Now, it's been argued, um, and I agree with a number of the points that uh, RJ and Vashak also made, that it's been argued, for instance, by the, by the High Commissioner of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, that uh, the precepts of the UDHR uh, are so fundamental that they can be applied to every new dilemma such as the regulation of AI uh, or addressing uh, climate change. I have some of my own doubts there, uh, but at least that's what the former uh, High Commissioner has said in one of the openings of the Human Rights Council sessions. Now, if you look at the drafting commission for the UDHR, uh, it included uh, Eleanor Roosevelt from the US, uh, Peng Chang from China, uh, Charles Malik from Lebanon, Hernan Cruz from Chile, and others from uh, Australia, France, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and so forth. You did not hear a single African country, did you? It is explainable, given the time, be because of the history of colonialism and so forth. But it's, it's also interesting to note that, despite these limitations, it has informed the African regional human rights system uh, for children, but also for adults alike. For instance, uh, Article 29 of the UDHI that says everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. Uh, it's found itself in the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, which talks about the responsibilities of the child, where it talks about the responsibilities towards the child's family, society, the state, uh, and other legally recognized communities and international community. Uh, and of course, this is subject to the child's age, but also ability, uh, and as su such limitations that may be contained in, in the African Children's Charter, so that it doesn't lead to a situation where by invoking the responsibilities of the child, states or families or committees do not violate the rights of the child. I remember, because this conversation is partly about practice, I remember one day uh, in 2011 uh, being in the Namibian parliament, discussing with parliamentarians about the draft Child Care and Protection Act that has been lingering for a long period of time. And I was there to address them on behalf of the African Union's African Council of Experts to see how they can actually push it forward. Uh, and they expressed concerns about you know, children's uh, irresponsible behaviors, that there are too many conversations about rights discourse, and there is, there is almost nothing uh, about uh, their responsibilities, uh, that your right ends where the right of the next child that is sitting to you uh, starts and so forth. Uh, and ultimately, with the introduction of the responsibilities of the child, they were able to pass uh, that, that uh, Child Care and Protection Act. South Africa has done the same thing. Nigeria has done the same thing. So the responsibilities of the child is something that has been taken forward from the UDHR that has actually, to a certain extent, paid uh, its dividends. Now, let me freeze this frame uh, on the general UDHR impact and offer a few words on four critical child rights issues uh, that the UDHR has addressed or has continued to address. The first one, which uh, Basha already addressed, uh, is the right to nationality. Article 15.1 says everyone has the right to a nationality, and further it says no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality nor denied the right to change his nationality. For children, the right to a nationality is a deal breaker. And mark the words, it's a right to a nationality. It's not the right to acquire a nationality as we have it under uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, or subsequent provisions that have been adopted uh, later. Globally, we're talking about around 10 million people in the world that are stateless. 60% of them uh, are actually children. Uh, they're told that they don't belong anywhere. Uh, they're denied a nationality. Uh, and without one, they are denied their basic rights. We are talking about from Cote d'Ivoire to Kenya to Myanmar to Bangladesh to Malaysia to Dominican Republic and a number of countries in the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, Qatar, many. Uh, 
And from a children's rights point of view, not having a nationality is devastating. Now, some of the reasons are obviously gender-based parentage laws. There are 25 countries, for instance, that retain nationality laws that deny women the right to pass their nationality to their children on an equal basis with men. Uh, there are three countries, Bahamas, Barbados, and Malaysia, that discriminate against men in terms of their ability to pass their nationality uh, to their children born outside of wedlock. Uh, others relate to discriminatory citizenship laws, changing borders, uh, and of course, revoking citizenship. One of the things that we've seen recent years is revoking citizenship of parents and children that are accused of being associated with terrorist groups or groups that have been designated as terrorists. The second one is Article 16.3, where it says, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. This is very important. If you look at the provisions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, families are absolutely critical. If you look at the preamble of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where it says children should grow up in an atmosphere of love, happiness, and understanding, families are very central to that. But many states, and as Bashak rightly outlined, many states use this article to push back at women's rights under the umbrella of the protection of the family agenda, at the Human Rights Council, at the Commission on the Status of Women, even in the conversations relating to SDGs. And that's a word for caution that I want to throw out there. The third one is the reference in Article 25.2 uh, of the UDHA about motherhood and childhood. Uh, it says motherhood and childhood are entitled to special assistance in care. Uh, all children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. These are absolutely important elements. In fact, at the time of the adoption of the UDHR, uh, during the third committee discussion, the UNICEF representative reported that only 6% of those eligible for aid had received it, and consequently, the infant mortality rate had reached an abnormally high level in those countries. You can talk about a whole range of countries where this provision is absolutely important. And the fourth and the last one is the right to education. Throughout the world, we have two, a staggering 244 million children and youths that are still out of school for social, economic, and cultural reasons. Children with disabilities, girls. In the context of COVID, we had a learning gap. That learning gap became a learning gulf. So the provision on the right to education is important, but it has its own limitations too. For instance, it doesn't address pre-primary. In children's rights lexicon, we talk about the first 1,000 days, the importance of pre-primary education, uh, and a significant barrier that children uh, are facing because of costs and so forth needs to be addressed. Uh, in fact, there is a conversation uh, that at the Human Rights Council session uh, in June 2023. Uh, Brazil uh, joined Luxembourg and Dominican Republic to make a statement of its own, where it went and said, all states should consider a new international legal instrument to formally recognize the right of every child to at least one year of preschool and to free inclusive public and quality secondary education. Again, highlighting the importance of the provision of the UDHR, but also some of its limitations. Now, in moving forward, as we speak today, what are some of the biggest challenges that children's rights face? Discrimination, especially on the basis of age. Corporal punishment is a good example. Why is it that we only have 65 countries that have banned corporal punishment in all settings and the rest have not done so? Conflict is another. Climate change is a child rights crisis. Uh, the digital environment is also absolutely critical for children's rights. In fact, the last two are a subject of the latest general comments that the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, has addressed. Now, some of the limitations of the UDHR to address these critical issues uh, is, obvi is, is obvious to a certain extent. For instance, uh, how is it going to be able to address uh, extraterritorial application? Uh, how is it going to address causation in the context of climate change? Uh, how is it going to be able to address some of the challenges that we're facing in the context of the war on terror that children are actually facing? Now, let me throw a couple of uh, challenges that came to my mind I was preparing for this, and I will end. The first is, there is a very good book that, uh, that is written by Professor uh, Harst Hannem. Uh, he just retired uh, from Tufts. It's titled... Rescuing Human Rights, Radically Moderate Approach. Uh, and the central thesis of the book is that the credibility of human rights is undermined by the proliferation of new rights, the linkage of rights to other issues such as international crimes uh, or the activities of business, uh, and the attempt to address every social problem from a human rights perspective. So one question that I want to out here is that are we trying, are we stretching the UDHR too much? to some of the issues that we're facing today that is not necessarily fit for purpose. And the second one, I would even dare and make a less popular remark here and say that the UN in general pays lip service to human rights when it talks about its three pillars. Its three pillars are peace and security, 
development uh, and human rights, whether it's on funding, whether it's on the extent to which child rights or human rights are embedded in its development agenda, whether it's on its work on peace and security, including some of the resolutions that actually come from the UN Security Council, uh, or how its financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, are upholding human rights. In reality, human rights is hardly a pillar. It is more of a stick. So we need to ask during the 75th anniversary of the, the UDHR, it is critical to reflect how the UDHR is helping and can help the UN, its secretariat, its agencies to have a more human rights and child rights lens. Thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you all, and thank you for keeping to time so well to enable us to have um, about 15 minutes for Q&A. So I welcome any questions or comments from the audience. Ariana. Thank you all so much for your comments. I thought they were really incredibly interesting. And the through line I noticed through all three comments was this idea of the UDHR as kind of something that was formed through an exclusive institution. Not all stakeholders were able to be represented in the formation of the UDHR. I'm really interested on your perspectives, obviously working with groups that are still not necessarily explicitly represented in the UDHR, thinking of trans people, thinking of sex workers, thinking of children. How do you kind of navigate that tension of pushing through the UDHR to be an inclusive document read progressively while also recognizing that it was created in an exclusive environment where a lot of the people that were trying to protect with the UDHR weren't necessarily in mind when it was written and don't necessarily even have access to the spaces where we're really litigating and discussing these ideas. Uh, the Bashak and um, Benyam, did you, were you able to hear that question? Yes, okay, excellent. Who would like to start us off? Um, I can start if it's okay. A couple of points that come to mind. Thank you for your question. Um, Again, from my own personal perspective and within a U.S. context, I'm always very explicit to say I'm only speaking from my experience and also from uh, this U.S. context because um, the realities are very different in some ways in each region. Uh, because I think part of the utility of the UDHR in the U.S. today is because still so few people know of it. I think that that actually gives us a lot of work to do in the U.S. context and a lot of opportunity, if you want to frame it positively, to use this tool as a tool of human rights education. No document written by human beings is perfect. Um, and of course, a document 75 years old, in my opinion, um, it has amazingly fewer limitations than I would think something from 1948 would have. Um, one example being um, some of the gender inclusive language. Your question reminds me of something I've dealt with for 20 plus years in US movements around, um, and I'm careful to say this so people don't misunderstand. I think we have in some ways in US activism an obsession with identity politics um, and some of the pushback from social justice activists in the U.S. for many, many years has been that the human rights framework, uh, they think, does not recognize identities, whether those be gender identities, sexual identities, indigenous identities, racial identities, and so forth. Um, my pushback to that is that, uh, one, that's not true because we have identity-specific international mechanisms, right? We have we have mechanisms and documents for the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, we have sexual rights declarations, whether or not they're officially recognized by the US. Um, the IPPF a declaration on sexual rights, for example. So human rights is not identity blind, uh, I would argue. And I actually think that it's inherently intersectional and so when progressive activists in the U.S. talk about intersectionality since the 90s, I argue that the human rights framework has always been inherently intersectional, that all human rights are interdependent. And in my experience, U.S. movements don't often think that way to this day, right now. They are extremely siloed, and I say this as someone having worked in seven different ones from reproductive justice to death penalty abolition, sex worker rights. 
and more restaurant worker rates. Um, very, very siloed, both in terms of our strategies, policy, education, research, what have you, but even more so, I think, in terms of um, issue and identity-based movements. And the human rights framework, for me and many of my colleagues, has been a framework that can unify and bring people together around intersectionality in really powerful ways. So, in my opinion, the UDHR doesn't need to name a list of identity groups because it's talking about, again, everyone's right to X, Y, Z. And uh, everyone means everyone. So I think as, as advocates, we have to really enforce the idea that all human beings have essential basic human rights that are inherent um, while not losing the identity specific issues and importance of recognizing marginalization and layers of oppression within identities. I think there's something to be said in the U.S. context for having a tool that is not only about identity. Shakar Benyam. I mean, I think this, this, is a, this is a great question. I mean, it's an interpretive question, right? I mean, it's, um, I think we need to understand the history of, of the UDHR, um, you know, who drafted it. I mean, there are lots of fantastic works on who was at the table, who wasn't at the table, um, you know, what, what kind of, um, you know, colonial in particular practices were in place. These are important historical, uh, you know, knowledge, and, and I think we, we have to know about that, that's for sure. But the second thing is um, what we call in legal interpretation, right, the object and the purpose. So, you know, there is one type of interpretation that's historical interpretation, looking at some sort of the historical lineage of how we make sense of a text, and the other is more of a purposive interpretation. So what is the object and the purpose of this treaty as we read it in 2023? And um, then we're all engaged in interpreting the UDHR and we're interpreting it today. We are not interpreting it as, you know, many, many years ago. And I think this, uh, the article one and the two of the UDHR, the Universal Declarations, first and the second articles, I think are quite telling. Uh, I think they, they give us a, a very good idea about what is uh, an inclusive interpretation? I mean, we can even sort of make sense of those ideas. So not just the word of the everyone, but also this very, um, you know, that these apply to everyone regardless of. And there's this incredible long list of what is that, you know, what are the status that should be excluded from how you really realize these rights. But I think, you know, whenever we talk about UDHR now, or even a hundred years from now, we will have these conversations. And I think, uh, perhaps one of the one of the interesting observations is that we're always interpreting it. I mean, I think I also think this is part and parcel of human rights law that this is what we're engaged in uh, most of the time. Um, but we have to engage in that interpretation. I don't think the text doesn't speak for itself, and I think we always speak with the text. Um, but it's very important to recognize all of its limitations. I think that makes it makes our engagement with the Universal Declaration a lot healthier. Um, and, uh, but yeah, maybe I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a, now I've just came out as a cautious optimist about potentials of interpreting this document, yeah. Thank you, I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. One is, um, maybe from a children's rights lens, um, not that optimistic that everyone means everyone. Uh, where it actually gets at the grassroots level, at the ground level, uh, at the national parliaments, at least in many instances, that's not how it's been interpreted. I speak English as a second language, everyone means everyone, no one means no one. But unfortunately, that's not how it's been done. If it was, then maybe half of the provisions of the Convention of the Rights of the Child would not have been necessary. Maybe we can say the same thing about the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in Tokyo. The other point that I would just want to make is uh, Article 2, where it makes reference to other status, has actually been a very useful uh, tool in this regard. Uh, it's very comparable uh, to the other grounds that are listed there uh, and other status has been interpreted. And of course, there are the exceptions where in their domestic legislation, uh, they incorporated the elements on sexual uh, orientation, like the South African constitution and so forth. Those are obviously outliers. Now, the point about intersectionality is absolutely critical. Uh, from a children's rights point of view, for instance, access to education, uh, if it is denied uh, because of that, access to the right to the standard of health, if it is denied because of that, uh, 
Uh, violence is one of the prohibitions. Uh, so the intersectionality element plays a very critical role. But I just want to also throw a word of caution. Uh, the limits of interpretation. As the Committee on the Rights of the Child, we saw a lot of states abusing the concept of uh, family uh, in the family unit and the protection of the family agenda that I just flagged. Uh, and they're interpreting, interpreting it in their own way, uh, which we felt was not actually promoting children's rights. So as the committee just a couple of months ago, we provided our interpretive guidance uh, on Article 5 to send a signal to states uh, that they should actually hopefully uh, stop uh, interpreting in such a way that it actually undermines the provisions of the Convention on the Right of the Child. The UDHI and the Convention are actually supposed to complement each other, uh, not be in a competition, one not being used to undermine the other. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Thank you for the lecture. So, uh, the question is uh, uh, maybe there are two conflicting trends in the area of human rights. One is that the need to extend the human rights, for example, to link the human rights to the Caribbean crisis, the need expansion. Another is the rising of the populism against the, the human rights. So, how do you see, especially in the European? in the Council of Europe, how do you see these two conflicting trends in happening in the human rights that for our future of the human rights sector? Thank you. Were you able to hear that online? No, okay. Um, so the question was um, an observation of two trends. Um, one, the need to expand human rights, for example, to climate change and other, other rights as well. And then secondly, increasing populism um, against human rights and how we think about these issues as we think about the future of human rights, um, include, specifically in the Council of Europe context. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. We have a lot of... Um, um, human rights-based climate litigation before the European Court of Human Rights at the moment. Uh, they're all pending cases, so we haven't yet uh, had a final uh, judgment from the European Court of Human Rights. So we were not able to give an answer, a court-based answer to your question as to how the European Court of Human Rights is going to deal with, uh, with, with this type of a problem. And, um, I think the uh, the sort of the, the, the kind of the populist uh, undermining of, of human rights law uh, is is a very widespread problem, uh, not just in the Council of Europe space, but in many uh, other other parts of the world. And of course, uh, it's a it's a really worrying problem because it attacks who is an authentic everyone, right? I mean, it kind of divides people as to authentic uh, everyone's and then the unauthentic persons that are not deserving of rights. And I think this is a very dangerous aspect of, um, of populist discourses. Um, when we look at uh, the judicial responses to kind of populist attacks, um, at least in the Council of Europe space, in particular from the European Court of Human Rights, we see that the court is not accepting these types of arguments. It is very clear in its kind of legal reasoning in cases that engage kind of this kind of populist colored populist may sometimes they also mix with authoritarian restrictions on rights. So I think the European Court of Human Rights um, is, is very clear on this or a lot of the legal independent uh, courts also across Europe uh, have not really um, entertained these arguments as, as sound legal arguments. But then we also have a very genuine problem because a lot of people politically support this type of discourses uh, around the world. So, and in the Council of Europe as well. And I don't have an answer for that. When you have the vast majority of populations, they actually, um, RG was talking about the human rights culture, how we build human rights culture. So I think the, the question is when the majority of people actually support exclusion of certain people from being protected under human rights, what do we do? And I don't think our answers are going to be legal um, answers um, to those. But I think many courts in the Council of Europe space have done well. Uh, but I think our problems about the human rights culture go a lot deeper into, into political um, discourses and, and practices that we have. Tough times in Europe. <laughs> 
uh, on this front. Thank you for that question. Can I, can I come to that question very briefly? Yes, please. Thank you. When, when we often talk about the, the UDA chart, uh, one line that is often thrown around is that it's one of the most uh, highly translated document in the world, 500 plus languages. I'm fascinated about that fact, but what I am more fascinated about is how it's actually also translated into child-friendly versions. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, one of the, the, the important tools that we have to push back on the populist agenda is through empowerment. And the best way to empower is to actually empower our children through the education system. For those that are not necessarily within the education system, you also need to make uh, provisions uh, for them. So human rights education uh, plays a very critical role. And often what we would do well to pay attention to the final words of the preamble of the UDHR, which says every individual and every organ of society, keeping this declaration constantly in mind, shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms. That is absolutely important, and that's a very important tool to the pushback on the populist agenda. Do you want to add anything? The only thing I'll add is I will second, you know, um, what my colleagues have said about, uh, and I have said about human rights culture. In my experience, um, some law students who then become lawyers become very one-track minded about litigation as the uh, sort of best or most important way of creating social change. Um, and I think that as human rights lawyers, again, at least speaking in a U.S. context, we need to respect the fact that we as lawyers have a particular role to play in supporting human rights, but people's movements, grassroots organizing, and, and to me, maybe most importantly, education, uh, has to go hand in hand with legal strategies. Um, often I say, I think some of the most impact I've made in human rights in my life have been those dinner table conversations, heart to heart, person to person dialogue. I really feel that you can change law and policy, but if people's hearts and minds don't change in any given society about any given thing, then uh, we probably will just replicate more bad policy. That um, brings us to time. So a huge thanks to all three of our speakers for joining us today and for those incredible insights and for all of you for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you both very much.